because, in fact, they retired the day before our S1 or IPO went effective because I actually wanted to see my kids grow up. Um, which, how many of you have families or want to have families? There's a, a search for a post called Epitaph for an Entrepreneur. How many of you have read it? Um, oh, okay. Uh, for those of you who haven't, print it out, hand it to your significant other, and then post it on your refrigerators. A couple of people are nodding. Um, it was our 21 years of how to stay married and do eight startups and have a couple kids. Um, and it wasn't like we figured it all out on day one. It was all the trial and error of having uh, uh, a career which could have consumed 24-7, but actually deciding to have a family and a career. And uh, I was not a part-time entrepreneur, but it was how to get everybody engaged. But the story is, I decided to see my kids grow up, so I didn't know what I was going to do next. Family's out skiing up in Tahoe. I decide, I'm going to write my memoirs. <laughs> I know, I, that sounds si even silly to me. And in fact, I got 80 pages into it, and I realized, two amazingly important things. One is, I'd have to pay my children to read this. Because um, <laughs> while it was exciting to me, it wasn't exciting to anybody else. And then two is, which was kind of why you're all here, is I realized there were patterns in what I had done for 20 years that I had never noticed. And not only patterns of the companies I had done, by the time I retired, I was sitting on technology advisory boards, I was on the boards of a couple of public companies, um, I invested in a ton, and those patterns that I was writing about in my career were repeating themselves in multiple companies, yet no one had ever called them. No one had ever said, hey, wait a minute, Silicon Valley, more technology risk per square inch than anywhere else in the world, and over 90% of startups that fail, fail from a lack of customers, not from a lack of technology? Oh my gosh, how come like, no one's writing about this stuff? And in fact, we have all these processes to manage product development. We have no processes to manage customer development. And that was the genesis of the book, Four Steps to the Epiphany. First started out as my class notes, um, which some of you could attest to if you've discovered all the unfinished sentences in the book. Um, and then one of my students, in fact, my best student, Eric Reese, who was taking my class at Berkeley, said, hey, why don't you slap a cover on it and stick it on Amazon? So now you know where the book came from. Um, so thank you, Eric. Um, but I have to tell you, when I started teaching entrepreneurship, teaching, hey, I'm a professor now. I know everything. I knew what entrepreneurship was. I knew what an entrepreneur in a startup was. I did it for 20 years. And luckily, head of my department said, Steve, you might want to sit in on some of these other professors' classes. Yeah, what do we, you know, I, I know. Steve, do me a favor, just sit in. I walked out a couple days later, stunned. I had no idea what they were talking about. It turns out that my definition of what a startup is, who an entrepreneur was, what a founder was, and what they were all supposed to do was completely different than what was being taught at Stanford, Berkeley, and Columbia. And in fact, I'll observe that even today, there is no agreement on what an entrepreneur and startup is. So I'm going to give you Steve Blank's taxonomy. And you could decide where you fit, who you are, what you want to accomplish. And this is just the preamble to this talk. I think there are six types of startups. Nothing magic about it. Um, the first startup is what I'll call lifestyle startups. These are entrepreneurs who start companies just to ha do enough work to live their passion. Now, up north, I also live on the coast. And to me, a classic California lifestyle entrepreneur is someone who wants to surf 24-7. Anybody a surfer here? Imagine you could do it 24-7, but you needed a job to at least pay the rent. So up north, I know a couple of friends. You know what they do to work? They teach surfing. They make enough money, then they put clothes on the store. And they go out and surf some more, and they run out of money, don't have any food, open. <laughs> OK, teach some more surfing, don't kill any surfers. OK, closed. Now translate that to not just surfing, but coding or anything else. Those people are entrepreneurs. 
They've started a company. They don't work for anybody else, but they're just working to live their passion. And so their goal is to create a small business, known customer, known product, feed the family, drive the passion. We don't really teach these people in entrepreneurship classes, but they truly fulfill at least my characterization of who's a founder and entrepreneur. Now, the other ones are small business startups. Instead of lifestyle startups, small business startups. Their goal is to build a business that allows them to be self-employed, but they don't wake up in the morning saying, I'm going to take over the universe. They wake up in the morning going, I hope I turn a profit this week. Small business startups, grocery stores, dry cleaners, carpenters, plumbers, database consultants, UI designers, people who just are happy to work for themselves. And their goal is to go from a startup to have a profitable small business. So they need to look for a business model. Profitable business, existing team. You know, if they make 100 grand a year in revenue, they're doing great. Now, my parents started as small business people. They were immigrants to the United States. Came over on the boat under the Statue of Liberty, went through Ellis Island, worked in sweatshops in the Lower East Side of New York, and their dream was to open a grocery store. Big American dream. And they worked really hard, and when we were tall enough not to drown in the pickle barrel, they allowed us to work in the store. Turned out that that was entrepreneurship. And in fact, in the United States, it is entrepreneurship. There are 5.7 million businesses in the US make up 99.7% of all corporations, employ about 50% of all non-governmental workers. Outside of technology clusters like New York, Silicon Valley, parts of Santa Monica, the United States, when you talk about entrepreneurship and founders, everybody is thinking about these people big idea. Entrepreneurship, founders, and startup outside of technology clusters means small business innovation and entrepreneurship. Now what Silicon Valley became known for is not this. Not let, let's do a startup and have a small repeatable business. It's for something I call scalable startups. Other people call them high growth startups. A scalable startup typically is solving for unknown customers and unknown features. But the founders have billion dollar visions. Billion dollar visions on day one. They're looking for a business model, but they're looking for total available markets that are huge so they could generate $100 million a year or more in revenue. Unlike the other businesses so far, scalable startups attract venture capital. Why? Because venture capitalists want obscene returns. In fact, the mob and venture capital have that one thing in common. <laughs> right? They are not happy with making 4% a year. Venture capital bets on scalable startups because while over 90% of their investments fail, the 10% that make it generate obscene returns if they're good. Now, a scalable startup is designed to grow big. And this, historically, is when Silicon Valley said startup who they meant. Now, in the last three to five years, there's one more category I'll share with you in a second. But I got to tell you a secret. When I was an entrepreneur, this was kind of how I thought it worked. I was a startup, and someday, if I succeed, I'll be the CEO of a large company. Right? How many of you think it works that way? Come on, raise your hand. Come on. Yeah, you're right. That's it. Don't tell anybody, but I'm about to show you the secret memo you'll never get. You ready? There's a box in the middle. <laughs> and the box in the middle says, you're fired. It's a big idea. 
Big idea. And you can never explain why until now. Turns out there truly is a box in the middle. You'll hear me say this throughout the entire presentation. What we now understand that startups really do, which I'll be talking about later, is search for a repeatable and scalable business model. Search. That's what founders are great at. While you think you might be great at coding, and you think you might be great at UI or great at something else, no, you're not. You're, you will fail if that's all you're great at. You're looking for a business model. We'll explain what that is, but think make money. Large companies are large because they've already figured out the business model. Their job is to execute a known business model. Oh, search, execute. But it's the stuff in the middle that screws up founders. Let me tell you how that goes. You've been a founder of a company for a year or two, and then one day you realize, hey, if we just keep doing this, this like number starts going positive. And oh my gosh, by accident, we're making money. Look at that. And you have a board meeting, and you're like really proud. You're going to announce, we, like we cracked the code. We found out how to make money thinking that maybe the parade could go around the cubicles and the confetti could be thrown over here for, and they'll pin the little award right, on, right here. And so that's how you're going into the board meeting. Now, you've got to understand from your investor's point of view, how many of you have VCs or investors? Anybody ever been through this? You see one VC every six weeks. What you don't realize, or I didn't for a long time, is they're seeing eight to 12 of you in those six week periods. They sit on eight to 12 boards. And so while you recognize who they are, in your parking lot, they're actually looking up your name and picture. Right? When they drive in, they're going, who, who is this guy again? But the day you announce, we have found a repeatable and scalable business model, and you're expecting the applause and the hugs and the high fives, all of a sudden your VCs start looking at you in a way that's making you very personally uncomfortable. <laughs> what do you think they're doing? What do you think they're doing? All of a sudden, your company, which had a negative value to them, all of a sudden is a very important part of their portfolio. And they're now taking your measure to see if you're the executive that could go from search to execute. And all that stuff you were great at, doing one thing on Monday, a different thing on Tuesday, 14 different things on Thursday, flying here to there, to ch changing the code, to doing this, to doing that, all of a sudden, those things are detriments rather than assets. Big idea. And what they need is not an executive who could search, but an operating executive who could take advantage of the business model you found. So just memo to self. When you find a repeatable model and the VCs start muttering operating exec, they're not doing anything to screw you. It's just that your interest and theirs have now become unaligned. And what you need to do as a founder, separate discussion, separate presentation, is understand what are the skills necessary to build an organization so it could eventually execute. Does that make sense to anybody ever encounter this of like, you know, I, I used to be running my company and the next day, like, they're pushing me out and I'm holding onto the door frame. I mean, that's what's going on. And it's actually quite understandable from their point of view, but they never tell you this, which is why it's the secret memo, when you get funded. Why? Because why would you ever take any money from the guys who tell you, hey, by the way, when you succeed, we'll fire you. Right? So everybody, every VC tends to lie to you until it comes to that point. Um, there's a second type of startup that's now emerged truly in the last three to five years. And this is another type of Silicon Valley or um, entrepreneurial cluster company. And just for the sake of definition, I'll call it a buyable startup. A buyable startup is typically an internet or mobile or gaming apps or advertising, etc. And their goal is to sell to a larger company. Hey, three to 50 million bucks, we're out of here. Thank you very much. Right? How many of you be happy with that kind of exit? Yeah, come on. How many of you want to hold out for a billion bucks? There you go. Okay. Two different models. 
Both of them are now funded. These are a lot more prevalent for all the reasons Eric and I talk about. The cost of starting these things could be done on your credit card. Time to market is measured in weeks and months rather than years, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Everything we know about lean is appropriate here. And I'll just ca create this category called viable startups to say that's also part of the ecosystem. But it turns out if somebody gave you 10 million bucks, you'd probably spend only you know, 9.5. Or else you'd be in Brazil, and that's another story. Um, but these startups don't require millions to get started. If you're successful and tend to grow them, they require millions later to scale. But they don't need the amount of cash, which is why we now get super angels rather than traditional VCs funding a large segment here. Does this make sense? Scalable startups, viable startups, versus small business and lifestyle. Now, there's another couple of startups also worth mentioning, particularly when we're in the business school. How many of you are in the business school here, getting your MBA? So here's the part you ought to pay attention to. You ready? It's the large companies. Sorry. Oh, by the way, before I get into large companies, Steve Blank's definition of a startup, pretty simple. Because I don't even know. So what is a startup? Oh, a startup's a thing that you have beer with on Friday. Oh, you know, and then I ask, well, how long have your startup been around? 12 years. There's no such thing as a 12-year-old startup. There's a 2-year-old startup with a 10-year-old failure attached to it. Um, and note to self, you know, you're no longer in the startup. A startup is a temporary, big idea, temporary organization used to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. Now, come up with your own one, but this one to me is a pretty actionable definition. When it's temporary, the goal of a startup is not to be a startup. The goal of a startup is to be a large company. All right? And what are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be searching for something. What are we searching for? Repeatable and scalable business model. How do we make money? How do we optimize users, et cetera? We'll explain that. All right, this is where the MBAs pay attention. Another type of innovation. MBAs, how many of you have read Clinton Christensen? Okay, needs to go on your reading list. Um, innovator's Dilemma, Innovator Solution. 15 years ago, Christensen, who's a professor at Harvard, really nailed the two things large companies do. One is they do sustaining innovation. That is, we know how to execute well. We know how to make cell phones cheaper every year. We know how to you know, make them in blue, green, and red, and we know how to make them in every country, and we know how to do everything about the cell phone business, or pick whatever industry. That's sustaining innovation. That does require innovation, but it's around your core business. Existing market, known customers, known product features. But one day, you're in the cell phone business, and you've been laughing at this outside company that thought they knew something about cell phones. <laughs> We've been, we're, we're Nokia. It was called Apple. By the way, I just came back from Finland, and you can't utter the word Nokia without every Finn, like, looking ashamed. And I told these guys they ought to lighten up. They said, you don't understand. It was our only national hero. I mean, they were, no, they were truly wrapped up in that, this was our champion. I said, lighten up. You guys have been disrupted. And what dis happens in disruption is you typically laugh at the new entrants in the beginning because they always look toy-like and stupid. But they tend to eat your share as they add more and more features. So, you know, iPhone 1 uh, doesn't have copy and paste. Who would ever buy a phone? Oh, well, shit. Um, <laughs> iPhone 4. Ooh, ooh, ooh. You know. By now, they're like going, maybe we should build one of these four years later. Disruption usually takes two forms to so, existing company. One is you're asleep at the wheel, and two is there's an external competitor that understands either technology or markets or customers in some way that you didn't. So Nokia and RIM, et cetera, were disrupted by the ultimate innovator, which was Apple. But they were also asleep at the wheel. How you counter disruption is you build, you partner, or you acquire. Best example is in Silicon Valley is Google. Google was the on-ramp to the internet. Does anybody remember Google? We only hire A students. Do you remember that? Yeah, they never would have hired Steve Jobs or Larry Ellison or Bill Gates. 
they never graduated from college, but that's another story. But Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg looked at that and said, we only hire pirates. Yeah. Now, I gotta tell you, for a couple of years it was the pirates versus A students, and right now the on-ramp to the net, most of the time, is not Google, it's Facebook. Google understands that. And the last couple of years, they've been countering disruption by acquisitions. And unlike traditional companies that used to buy customers or businesses, Google buys talent. They just buy teams, sometimes with products. Android, do they buy an entire product line and business? No, they acquired a small company that had a prototype with a killer CEO, Andy Rubin, who you know, has taken over that part of the business. Large companies countered disruption by either ignoring it and going out of business, but more often trying to either build it, partner, or acquire. And so for MBAs in this room, understanding that in the 21st century, the cycle of disruption for existing businesses, not just technology, is starting to be compressed, more rapid, more innovations required. And Steve Jobs, God rest his soul, is going to become the benchmark for every Fortune 1000 CEO who needs to build constant innovation and entrepreneurship inside their own company. You know, what people don't realize about Jobs is that he long passed just being a technology icon or a Silicon Valley icon. You know, he long passed the metaphor of, oh, our next Thomas Edison or Henry Ford or maybe even Thomas Edison with P Picasso thrown in. He was something we haven't seen before. He was, in fact, the best global innovation executive, period, period. And that will be the benchmark for large corporations for the rest of the century. By the way, the last type of startup, social entrepreneurship. These are entrepreneurs who get ready for this. I don't know how to say this inside of business school. Don't want to make money. Can't figure it out. I get a good number of them in Berkeley and Stanford as well. Um, they decide that they'd like to live their lives solving pressing social problems. Either building a profitable company, but using social entrepreneurship as a brand advantage, seventh generation, method, et cetera, some good examples, Ben and Jerry's. Or they want to create entirely new nonprofits, NGOs, Kiva, et cetera. And I only say this half facetiously, please don't get me wrong. I am blown away by people who decide in your 20s that this is where you'd like to spend your life. I sit on lots of boards and nonprofits. Um, it just wasn't who I was, but it just makes me in awe of people who dedicate their lives to doing this. So that's the six types of startups. And why is it important when I even go through this? Because each one of these startups require different skills. And here we are in a university. My biggest takeaway when I stepped out of those classrooms dazed going, whoa, all I knew about was scalable startups. That's what I did for 20 years. Yet we were all teaching entrepreneurship like it was this one thing, that the skills you need to do a scalable startup are exactly the same skills that you need to do in a large corporation. No way. Anybody ever try to start an innovative division in a large corporation? Right? Anybody know what the biggest issue is in a large corporation trying to be innovative? The CFO. And number two, the head of HR. Right? Seriously, these are real issues. And if you don't understand them and treat them just like a startup, you're already doomed to failure. Um, because what we now know, by the way, and this is what we got wrong for 40 years in Silicon Valley, is startups are not smaller versions of large companies. Large companies execute. Startups search. Now, any accountants in the room? All right, all right. I will, um, anybody want a refund, I will pay your 20 bucks back. Uh, but typically, accountants, don't run startups. And here's why. Startups are searching and pivoting. 
What a startup knows on day one is that everything they think is simply a hypothesis. It's a guess. That startups need to get out of the building and test everything they think they know. Yet in large companies, it's all about execution. Cash flow break even, profitability, scale, senior management. And by the way, when you get to 150 people, anybody know what that number is called? Dunbar's number. Magic number, go look it up. Turns out you are immediately a large company. It has to do with how the human brain processes tribes, groups, etc. Now, large companies, you can't run a large company without knowing accounting. Anybody take accounting? Yeah, good. Okay, save that. So maybe you have something to account. Okay? Okay? Balance sheet, income statement, cash flow. Great story. I did startups for 20 years. Every startup, first couple months goes like this. I have my first board meeting. I know what the VCs want to see. They want to see my financials. Income statement, balance sheet, cash flow. I have a rent a CFO, he types them up, formats them, the fonts line up, the columns are beautiful. I push them across the table, and the VCs go, well, hey, look at these columns, etc." And then, what do you think the income statement said month one? Zero. But man, is that formatted correctly? And we talk about that, you know, in the boardroom. Hey, look at that income statement. Okay. Second board meeting. Yeah, hey, look at that. We do this for 21 years. Not like for one company, I did it for eight. Never once going, what are we doing? Because in a startup, I'm just going to now piss off every VC in LA. If that's all your board knows how to do, walk out of the room. Tell them, thank you for the check, but fire me now. Because, you know what? You should be so lucky to need this crap. All you need to know is how much am I burning per month, and how many months does that like add up to? Hand that to your six-year-old, and they can figure that out. Those are the only two numbers you need to know. In your first year of your startup, you want your board beating you with a stick, trying to figure out what are your business metrics, not what your accounting metrics. The metrics you need to be figuring out is all the stuff about your business model. If you're in the internet, for example, what's my customer acquisition cost? Do I have a viral coefficient? Is customer lifetime value, average selling price? All this stuff will change depending on your, on your business and business model. But those are the numbers that need to be discussed in a board meeting. Does that make sense at all? It's not that ultimately you don't want to have this discussion, but if this is dominating the conversation on day one, like you've got people who are adding zero value now. If that's all they know how to do, tell them to come back when you find the business model, but you don't need them in your room. They're just like acting busy. The next thing is sales. Sales in a large corporation. Anybody know how tall the VP of sales of a Fortune 100 company is? Six foot two, of course. Gray hair if he's a guy. Gray hair if it's a woman. <laughs> Great golf game. No joke. And anybody ever work for a Fortune 100 or 1,000 company? Is that true? Is that what they look like? And you think I'm making this up. It's not an accident. And it's not that they don't need to do this. They actually do need to do this. Large companies, VPs of sales, have figured out how to manage sales organizations play golf or integrate themselves with large customers and have a sales organization that's scalable and can sell off of priceless data sheets, known material. Now to me, when I did startups, my ultimate fantasy, the ones at least I could tell you about, was to hire a large company VP of sales as early as I could. Some of you are laughing. It's the curse of getting what you asked for. Because in my last startup, hey, we were funded by Kleiner Perkins, we were the hottest whatever, and I got my wish. I hired a senior director of sales from Oracle. Somebody who was going to the million dollar club or $20 million club in Hawaii, just always wanted to work in a startup, and he was a world class guy. 
<sighs> so it's now month six in our startup. It's a rainy California winter. We've now given probably five presentations in a row, and five times in a row with my new VP of sales, we were literally booted out of an office. And I'm like in shock. And I stumble into the car, VP of sales is driving, that's his job, his job. And I'm just a dumb founder, and I'm like just, Jay, we just got thrown out. Jay is smiling. I said, Jay, why are you smiling? He said, Steve, world-class VPs of sales. This just rolls right off our back. We, no, we have thick skins. This is what you hire us for. And I'm going, I gotta fire this guy. <laughs> and, and so he puts the key in the car and said, where are we going? He said, Steve, we've got three more calls to make. I said, Jay, we were just thrown out. This stuff doesn't work. I mean, whatever we're saying is just not working. So I take out my laptop and I start typing. And he goes, what are you doing? And I go, Jay, I'm changing the presentation. And whoa, the car almost went off the road. You can't do that. Well, why not? Well, I memorized the last presentation. Well, Jay, it didn't work. It doesn't matter, I memorized it. Okay, well, you know, the back on the road. Steve, what are you doing now? Well, I'm changing the price list. Whoa, car almost went. You can't do that. I just realized that a large company executive is comfortable with certainty. Not always, but it explains why large company executives don't do well in startups. In startups, sales, is selling where pricing and features and the entire business model is unstable. It's not yet repeatable, it's done one-offs. You're making it up as you go. By the way, this explains a ton of behaviors. Anybody ever hire an, a, a, a senior VP from a large company into a startup before the business model was frozen? Anybody have a good experience? Um, it sometimes happens, but most often than not, Here's what goes wrong. It's a big idea. And by the way, you get to buy beer every time I say big idea. Uh, we confuse the titles, which are identical in a large company and in a startup. The titles are the same, but the job specs are completely different. Think about that. The job specs are completely different whether they're a VP of sales, VP of marketing, product management, VP of engineering. Product management delivers MRDs, doing customer development in a startup. VP of engineering, large company, requirement docs, waterfall development. I could usually tell that they hired the wrong VP of engineering in any startup in the first year or two when he starts telling me about the tech pubs department. See a couple of people texting, fire, tech pups department. Why? Because in a startup, if your head of engineering isn't doing agile development and worrying about how many releases a day you're doing, you've hired the wrong people. Doesn't mean eventually you don't want to have QA and tech pups. Maybe you should be so lucky. But right now, you're not doing this just to see how many releases you could do. You're doing this so you could see what the customer needs are. And if you're not doing agile engineering, you really can't do customer development. The last piece is large companies plan. This is my favorite. For years, we had to write business plans. Anybody ever write business plans? Do they still teach that in UCLA? Yeah. Don't, don't raise your hand if you do, because there might be a professor in the room I'm going to insult. So business plans are now defined in Silicon Valley as the documents that VCs make you write, which no one reads. <laughs> right? And we're kind of even past that. Even VCs kind of giggle when you talk about a business plan. Business plans make all the sense in the world for large corporations. They do. When you're doing a follow-on product, you know the market, you know the customers, you know the channels. And you're talking about what features or what changes you're making in product two, three through N. But in a startup, those are all unknown. And therefore, what you really want to do 
is be working on a business model. So, you know, the thinking used to be in the Valley is, all I need to do is write a business plan. And then I just execute the plan, because that's what I did in a large company. After 40 years of detailed scientific research, we now understand the following. No business plan survives first contact with customers. It doesn't. Might be corner cases if you're doing a clone business in an existing market, but those are exceptions. And the part that truly doesn't survive first contact with customers is usually called Appendix A, the revenue plan, which most of you, if you would admit, was written under the influence of something <laughs> and actually deserves to be taught in the English department under the creative writing section. Now, just to screw with my students, I tell them that, of course, they know Excel has an automatic business plan generator if you find the right code keys. And I still have students going, really, Gay? I haven't found it yet. Um, so what do you do instead in a startup? We kind of now understand that the right thing to do is to be searching for a business model. Now, a business model is a great you know, academic thing, because if you get three professors in a room, it used to be you could come up with 14 definitions of a business model and completely confuse any class, but look important. But instead, in the last year, I've just kind of decided that Alexander Osterwalder's work, which says any company can be, can be described in nine building blocks, was the way I wanted to go. And so I use Osterwalder's definition of what a business model is. And he said, look, the first thing you need to think about in any business is, who the heck are your customers? Who are they? Great. Write them down. What are you going to sell them? He uses a fancy word called value proposition. Think of it as, what's your product or service that you're going to deliver to these customers? How are you going to deliver it? On the web, it's pretty easy. There it is. Boom. If you have a physical product, how are you going to get it to that customer? What's the sales channel? And how are you going to create demand? He calls it customer relationships. I think it's even easier. On the web, is it SEO or SEM or Facebook ads? If it's a physical product, is it radio or TV or, you know, again, web ads? How are you driving demand into that channel? And by the way, do you have any interest in making money? Probably a pretty good thing. Uh, but there are some business models that are multi-sided models. Google. How many of you use Google? Right. How many of you pay to use Google? Oh, some of you figured out how you do pay for Google. The rest of us, thank you for paying for us, because you know, they make more money than anybody on the planet. Now, for those of you who don't pay for Google, what product do you use in Google? What do you use? Search bar, right? And you don't pay anything. Let's just talk about Google search for a second. But there's a whole other side of Google search. What are you paying for? AdWords, what product do you see? What yeah. And what am I selling no, what do you see? When, do you see the search bar or would you see something? Yeah, I see that. Yeah, and you see the AdWords user interface. So while the rest of us are getting the product for free, there's a whole nother product. The other side when we say multi-sided market. In multi-sided markets there are multiple value props. Delivered to multiple customer segments. There are hundreds of millions of Google users, but there's probably less than 100,000 AdWord buyers who are like paying for everything. And they typically have different revenue models. So different products, different customer segments, different revenue models, sometimes different channels as well. Make sense? You now just learned the definition of a multi-sided market. On the other side, Key resources. What do you need for your business to run? For a software company, it's pretty easy. I need world-class engineers. And you could define that to, I need UI people, back-end people, et cetera. Might need some great marketeers. What do they need to do? What are the key activities? Do they need to code, or do I need a warehouse, or do I need something else? Do I need any key partners? Nah, I never need partners. Well, let's look at Steve Jobs again. You know, when the first iPod came out, it was a great piece of hardware. But everybody had great hardware. 
The first big insight was iTunes. Great piece of software, had an ecosystem. But what Jobs was able to do is get partners who owned content in a way no other normal human being could have done. And most of you are in LA, so you understand. The impossible job he did in walking into the head of a record label and saying, you will give me all your content. <laughs> and they were, ha, ah, and they, you will give me, a, and after about three minutes, they would say, here is all our content. <laughs> and then they woke up about three years later going, how come he's making, what the hell happened here? That's the definition of a partner, at least the Apple version. <laughs> and the last piece was, what's the resulting cost structure? No joke. Every one of you who are doing a startup needs to understand these pieces. The most important pieces, to be honest, on day one is, what's the value prop, who the heck are the customers, and how do I make money? I mean, like, if you don't get that, like, what are you doing? Now, Osterwalder has actually turned this into what's called the business model canvas, which you could download from the web. And I usually have students start with multiple business models. Who could these uh, customers be? And what kind of channels could we use? Because paper's free. Literally, you paste this to a wall, you have little sticky notes, it's a great thought exercise. But you realize, after doing this for about an hour, that the, these are just hypotheses. Now, you got to know, I love to use the word hypotheses. Because at Stanford, they pay $50,000 to hear that word. Because they could tell their parents, we learned all about hypotheses. And they go, oh, great, write another check to Stanford this quarter. Anybody know what the real word for hypothesis is? Yeah. F and guesses, right? They're just F and guesses. We're just guessing. It looks better now because they're organized on the wall and, you know, it looks impressive. I'm guessing. But you're still guessing because you're still inside the building. And that brings us finally to what the heck I'm supposed to talk about. Can I keep going? All right, it's customer development. And that's the process of having the founders get out of the building and start searching for the facts behind those guesses. Business model design is you setting up my theory, but customer development is how I get outside and take every one of those guesses and kick its butt around the country or the world, testing whether I was hallucinating, more than likely, or whether I was correct, had a vision. And the customer development process is a four-step process. Customer discovery, customer validation, customer creation, and company building. When I first drew this 10 years ago, I had this loop that said, you know, you're more than likely wrong. But I never named it. Another wonderful Eric Ries invention. He said, Steve, that's the pivot. I loved it. Eric had a couple of observations. One is, that what you're doing in this phase, discovery and validation, is testing when you're building a product the smallest possible feature set that gets you the most something. And I'll explain this in a second, but there are two key ideas here. It used to be, in the dark old days of engineering, that we would spec an entire product because the founder said so. Here's my product spec. I believe I know what the customer wants, so the natural outcome of my belief is a product spec. I don't need to talk to anybody. I've gotten funded. I'm the founder. Today we know that's a going out of business proposition. For those of you still doing that, just look at your shoes right now. Um, but it is a bad idea. It's a good idea in a large company where you might actually know who the customers are. In a startup, doing that is insane. What you really want to do is still have that vision, but figure out what's the minimum possible piece of that product you could build to test some of your hypotheses. Whether it's to get orders, or learn about the customer segment, or feedback, or quickly figure out if you're going to fail. But the idea is to use agile engineering to very quickly get some feedback. And the pivot is defined 
as a change in one or more of the business model canvas components. Remember I said you put up all those hypotheses? The minute you learn something that says, oh my gosh, the customers aren't over here, they're over here. And you make a substantial change in one of those boxes, you've just pivoted. Or you figure out, wait a minute, I thought my revenue model was freemium? It ought to be direct sales. That's a pivot. Oh, but I ought to change the pricing from $9.99 to $8.99. That's not a pivot, that's an iteration. You've learned something, but it wasn't a substantive change. Make sense so far? So the pivot actually is the heart of customer development. It's a subtle but important change in how we think about startups in the last 30 years. A pivot used to require you to fire an executive. It's not a joke. In the old days, what would happen is you would build the entire product, you'd go to first customer ship, you'd have this revenue forecast, and the first board meeting, everybody's high-fiving each other, because boy, was that product launch great. You know, look at all the blogs we've gotten written up in, or in the press, and everybody's excited, and the VP of marketing is feeling good, and had a sales of smiling, because there was a lot of you know, noise about the product. Six weeks later, you have another board meeting. This time the board, you know, still happy, they're trying to remember your names, but they kind of remember there was good in meeting last time, they turn to the VP of sales and ask her, how are we doing? And she goes, great pipeline. Now, if you know sales, that's where you're supposed to laugh, because it's not supposed to be a pipeline, there's supposed to be revenue. But instead she's going, oh man, that pipeline, meaning we got a lot of leads or something, it looks really good. And the board goes, you know, it's just been one board meeting in a large corporation. Again, for Anderson MBAs, this is a huge deal. In a large corporation, you are hired to perform and execute a known job spec. If you screw up execution of a known function in an existing corporation, you're an idiot. Yeah, you're an idiot. Yeah, yeah or both of you are idiots. Think about it. People have been doing this job for 30 years. They know how to do it. It's a spec. It's a VP of sales or something. There's a known spec. So we expect that you need to be replaced because it is a failure. The mistake we've made for decades was treating startups just like that. Where in fact, we're wrong. There is no known spec. And in fact, what we never manage to say out loud is that startups mostly go from failure to failure inside the company. That the first year or two, you're learning by failing and iterating. Any startup that's executing per plan only exists in the mind of business school professors. Me too, that's how I used to teach this stuff. The life does not unfold like a case study. And for those of you who went from business, anybody go from business school to a startup? Did anybody find a startup looked anything like a business school case? No. No. Big idea. The other thing that matters is cycle time, which is also not typical in a large company. The speed of the cycle, how quickly you learn, minimizes your cash needs, because cash is more important than your mother in a startup unless you really like her, and then it's right up there. The minimum feature set speeds up the cycle time, and near instantaneous customer feedback, at least for web-based startups, drives the feature set. So if we blow up the customer discovery box, what is it you're supposed to do? You know, put together business model canvas, take out hypotheses, test the problem, test the solution, figure out whether you're gonna pivot or proceed. But when I first wrote the four steps of the epiphany, customer development was all about what I knew, which was enterprise software. That was it. That's what the book was kind of centered about. And if you were in the web or you were in anything else, you kind of had to fake it yourself, which Eric Ries did wonderfully at IMVU. What about medical devices, semiconductors, web, mobile, cloud? And that's the second decade. So let me quickly go through what that is. When I was thinking about how to make customer development work for all possible configurations of startups, 
I realized it could be done by special casing every possible startup and we would run out of atoms in the universe. So instead, I just kind of thought about this and said, you know, let's think about what's happened in distribution channels. We have two types or two ways to distribute products in the 21st century. How we used to do them physically by moving a physical product from a factory to a sales endpoint, a store, or somewhere else. But now we could also distribute products virtually, either as a mobile app or just as bits. And we could think of products as occurring in two different configurations. Physical products, things you could touch and feel, smell, or virtual products, which don't exist at all other than on your computer or your smartphone. In fact, when you put these things together, you find you have a two-by-two two matrix to describe what I will contend to be almost any type of startup company. Let me give you an example. Physical product, physical sales channel, food, right? Can't eat bits. Get it in a grocery store, cars, planes, steel, solar panels, bookstores, consumer electronics, historically, physical product, physical channel. Some of these are now distributed in other places, but those are historically, in fact, that box on the bottom, right, was basically all business was before the middle of the 20th century. Physical product, physical channel. But then we started physically selling things you couldn't quite touch or eat. Life insurance, stocks and bonds. Then in the mid-70s, enterprise software, then in the 80s and 90s, shrink wrap software. There were entire stores selling bits, physical stores. In fact, GameStop is still around. They may stop in GameStop. Still, what you're buying, you're buying bits in a physical store. Seems a little weird, but that's what we still do. But starting in 1995, Netscape's IPO, my definition of the beginning of the internet boom. We could buy physical products virtually. There was no physical storefront. Books, shoes, movies, consumer electronics. And now, we could buy bits and feel great about spending money on things we don't even own and touch. Games on Zynga, Facebook, movies. Netscape has moved up, streaming. Kindle, books, etc. Does this make sense? You can now describe almost every possible company in saying, is it a physical channel, virtual channel? Is the product physical or virtual? What does this have to do with customer discovery and customer development? We now could break down the next generation of customer development by just saying, is our product physical or virtual? And for all cases, you start with Osterwalder's business model canvas. But then if you're a physical product, you start figuring out market size, you spec the minimum viable product and the physical product, you go start specking customers and channel and market type, you start extracting all the hypotheses you have from your business model. But if you're on the web, you're doing something quite different. You're no longer just talking about hypotheses, you're specking what we call the low fidelity minimum viable product, which is typically your first website or mobile app, ASAP. And you're talking about not get, keep, and grow customers, but you're talking about your plans for acquisition and activation. For physical product, how you test the problem is you get out of the building, and maybe you have a prototype Maybe you just have great slides, but you start talking to a ton of customers, I bought, I bought. But things are different now if you have a virtual product. Because right now, you need to be worrying about customer engagement by building a web page or mobile app today, now. What I call the low fidelity version. It doesn't have to be every feature, it doesn't have to be fancy graphics, but I want you to start testing stuff 
now. And you start, start thinking about traffic and competitive analysis. If you're a physical product, you test the solution, you create a prototype or, uh, and a product presentation, and you actually test the solution with the customer. If you're on the web, you test the high fidelity, meaning more fully featured minimum viable product, and you start measuring customer behavior. You update your business model, get your first advisory board members, and then you pivot or proceed to the next step. Most of the time, you'll find you didn't learn enough. But you might decide, we do know enough, let's see if we could get some serious orders or start getting scale if we're on the web. And so the next step is customer validation. Get ready to sell, sell, take the data and position your company, and again, pivot or proceed. Validation, physical product, you develop sales materials, you start hiring somebody to help you actually close orders, you have a sales channel action plan, and you refine the roadmap that you think you'll need to sell. But the web is very different. You actually start putting together your demand creation tools for acquisition and activation. You build a higher fidelity version of your website or mobile app. You build metrics and metrics tools. And you actually hire people who could start analyzing the data. In a physical product, you're looking for early customers and you start selling. In a virtual product, you start getting users or orders and you start testing traffic partners. In both physical and virtual, you do company and product positioning, you assemble data, validate your financial model, and you pivot or proceed to see whether you're going to raise a ton of money and scale the company. But these two steps are what it takes. We got five minutes to show you an example. Should we? Yeah? Okay. So this is nice theory, but this physical versus virtual really helps refine what is it you're supposed to be doing in customer discovery and validation. Let me show you a class I teach at Stanford, the Lean Launchpad class. These students are engineers. They have eight weeks to not only build the product, everybody teaches that, it's to get out of the building and get orders. They have to build the product and get orders in eight weeks using customer development. Let me show you an example or two. Tell me when you're bored. These guys were machine vision experts. They were, you know, rocket scientists. We could, you know, teach computers to recognize stuff. They talked to 75 customers physically in eight weeks. I'll show you what they did. They decided, hey, we're machine vision guys. You know what would be cool? Let's go build a tractor that can mow the lawn itself. And I went, your parents sent you to Stanford for this? You're going to build a fucking lawnmower? you got to be kidding. Oh, but it's going to be cool. It's going to, you know, we're going to drive around. It was like, you know, every boy's vision. Oh, yeah. You know. Okay, well, what are you use it for? Golf courses and people with big lawns. Okay. And so, great. That's who your customer segment is? Get the hell out of the building. Well, can we build it somewhere? Oh, you've got to build it too, but get out of the building and start talking to people. So, they started, and that was their idea. They did, in the first two weeks, 20 interviews, six site visits. And they started talking to people who did both mowing, Stanford Golf Course, parks, etc., cetera, tor Toro dealers, user of backyard mowing systems. But they also said, you know, let's try a different customer segment while we're at it. We don't think anybody would be interested, but let's talk to people who would be interested in weeding, you know, farmers. <laughs> you know, who the hell would want a robotic farming machine? Because we beat them up a little hard. So talk to some other people. And so they went out and... As you guys know, in California, the Central Valley isn't that far from Stanford. It was about 160 miles round trip. They went out and talked to a bunch of people. A whole couple of farms, Bakersfield, uh, Salinas Valley, got some people on the phone in Nebraska, etc. And remember, here was their first business model canvas. Right? We made them take Osterwalder's canvas, tell us what your value proposition is, you know, who are your customers, how are you going to make money, What's your channel? All the things you would expect on day one from engineers. We're going to sell the hardware. You know, we're going to sell to publicly, uh, public or commercial used green spaces like that, golf courses. Um, you know, our key resources, resources are, of course, engineers with autonomous vehicles. Great. 
But while you're out there, why don't you find out some other stuff? And they started discovering that, you know, while it's great to be thinking about a robotic lawnmower, they found that weeding in organic farm fields is a huge problem. Why? Because farmers in California need to hire crews of hundreds or thousands to manually, because you can't use chemicals, pick weeds multiple times as a crop is growing, one to five weedings a year, and it's expensive and has big risk of food contamination. So they had a decision to make. Do we want to be in mowing or did we want to be me weeding? And would an autonomous vehicle solve this problem? And so they decided, you know what? We think the data is telling us we ought to be in the weeding business. So everything in red is their first pivots. Big idea. Pivots, change of one or more of the business model canvas components. They now said, we're in the farming weeding business. And our partners are going to be ag dealers and service providers, and our whole value proposition just changed. Now, you've got to understand, any engineers in this room? Right. These guys, they weren't just engineers. They were Stanford engineers. <laughs> Who could do anything? So I said, great, you guys found out a lot of stuff. Where's the robot? They <laughs> said, Professor Blank, don't build a robot in like a year, you know, maybe at the end of the year. I said, no, no, no. Where's the robot? They said, maybe you didn't hear us. I said, no, 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 maybe you didn't hear me. Let me explain something you've probably never seen at Stanford. It's a bee, bee. It looks like this, a bee. <laughs> <laughs> and there was like, I was speaking in Polish, because they went, wah, wah, and I said, bee. It's, you know, you'll show this to your parents. It's okay, you're grad students, I'm sure. That, no, bee, we can't, we're not gonna take the client. What do you mean? We can't, maybe we'll have the robot by the end of the semester. I said, next week. What, no, we're quitting, we can't, we can't be done. I'm, next week, B, B. <laughs> they walked out, the most pissed guys you've ever seen in your life. Yeah, ooh, I got off on that. <laughs> because I knew what would happen. They showed up with a carrot bot next week. 100 hours. No sleep, entire team. They probably failed every other class. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and they took the CarrotBot, a machine vision data collection pro, uh, platform with monochrome and color cameras, laser line sweepers, encoders, onboard data acquisition. In fact, they were about to mount a high powered DARPA laser before I stopped them, thinking they'll kill Fluffy or a farm worker. <laughs> and said, so, This is good enough. Thank you very much. And they got out. And I actually started taking real measurements. Um, when you push somebody, this is what they do if they're excellent. Um, and so they updated their canvas. You know, key resources are now about IP and patents and video classifier files. They're now thinking that we're kind of narrowing. Um, it's a weeding service provider, maybe conventional farmers. And we think we're doing direct service. We're no longer just selling hardware. Maybe we'll rent it. So their business model is getting a little more sophisticated. And they were now showing us all pictures of the farm fields and look at the weeds and look, there's, a, you know, there's the plant and there's the weed and look, and you know, they're buddies with farmers and here's our competitor and you know, they're drawing customer hypotheses and you know, they're now showing you uh, pictures of Cliff, the farm manager and you know. <laughs> all right, all right, now we're, now we're, and by the way, this is just week four. And more, you know, there's me and Marty and, you know, Doug, you know, the grower and, and their business model canvas. Okay, we think we understand mid to large organic farmers. And we're still doing direct service with equipment rental. Um, we still got to work on patents and have still some technology issues. And then, just coincidentally in California, the World Ag Expo happens. These guys dress up in denim and boots and they show up and they do interviews at the shows. They figure out their revenue stream. You know, they're still updating their canvas. And then what they finally find out, and I have to tell you, for me, while all this was fun, here's something you would never have figured out as smart as you are. The farmers taught them, is listen, you could try to sell us hardware at 150 grand. We buy hardware. But we'd love to pay you guys per acre with a modifier according to weed density. The farmers taught them how to price the product. They said, you do this, 
and we'll, we'll buy this stuff for you forever. Now you should know the goal of this was not to make them a business. This was teaching them a methodology. Now these guys happened to ignore all that and just got funded, so just FYI. Um, should I show you one more example or would you like to, one more example? Now you gotta understand, I picked some hardware guys because listen, this is a no-brainer for software, right? You know, doing the lean process is pretty easy for software, but people say, well, Steve, this would never work for hardware. There was one. Let me show you another hardware team. So out of the f uh, 14 teams, uh, uh, I'm going to show you the two hardware ones. These were guys uh, uh, who were also uh, hardcore hardware engineers who decided to go after breast cancer uh, because they were going to build a device that had uh, uh, much better resolution and much better um, uh, detection than traditional mammography. So the first thing they did was a technology comparison and I agreed that they could put up a little blue bar over their stuff which and that uh, initial says if I told you I would have to kill you um, in terms of their technology comparison but the technology truly was good. They did their first business model canvas you know, who are the customers? It's going to be radiologists and hospitals, capital equipment sales. Oh, it's, Steve, this is easy. We'll just build this thing and we'll just sell this to doctors and hospitals and put all the mammography people out of business. <laughs> okay, great, good. Good luck, guys. See you later. So their first test, which we make people get out of the building for, first thing we tell you, test your customer segment and value prop. Those are the first things. If you're not testing those, I don't care about your revenue model. Good. You think that's your customer? Get the hell out of the building. So first, these are finding the right customers. So here's what they talked to, leading doctors and patients and technicians and hospital managers. And we made them draw in this case because it was fairly complicated. Remember, these are engineers who have never been in a hospital, doctors, or whatever. First week, this is what they drew. Here's how hospitals make decisions. Boom, boom, boom. And they said, oh my god, this is pretty complex. And there are several saboteurs, and that was the word we taught them, people who don't want you to succeed because it threatens your jo their job. And they said, boy, there are a ton of saboteurs in here. So they said, okay, let's look at private practice. You know, private breast radiologists, uh, peer doctors, etc. And they said, hey, private practice, faster adoption rate, attractive value proposition. So their business model canvas now kind of looked like this. Um, you know, they were going to go after OBGYNs and uh, private practice uh, people. And now the question was, how do you get to them? So getting to the customer. They said, so what's the sales and marketing stuff? We just kind of laughed and said, okay, you need to interview some more people. So the next week they went out and talked to people who knew something about sales and marketing and FDA clinical trials. And they quickly realized that market adoption for something that was going to replace mammography required all these things. How do you get to the American College of Obstetricians and uh, Gyne uh, Gynecologists? How are you going to get to key opinion leaders, medical journals, continuing medical education conferences, and breast cancer advocacy groups? I thought this was a pretty darn good slide. And they said, OK, we're done. I said, B. B. <laughs> they said, what do you mean? We drew the diagram. This is it. I said, well, this doesn't mean anything. Undergrads could do this. <laughs> they were insulted. I said, tell me how you're going to do each one of these in detail. He said, well, wait a minute. This is like week three. I said, well, that's okay. Week four, I want to see this. All right. So they decided, okay, to get to the American College of uh, Gynecologists, this is what we're going to have to do. To get to the key opinion leaders, this is what we're going to have to do. To get to the medical journals, this is what we're going to have to do. To get to continuing medical education, this. Uh, conferences, this. Breast cancer advocacy groups, this. So they did one more level of detail. Then for direct sale, then for sales, we could either do direct sales or distributors. And I said, well, you got to pick one. They said, okay, we'll do five dedicated salespeople at first, and then we'll continue with a, a core group of salespeople, but use women health care equipment distributors. And so they put together a pricing strategy that customers and investors said they'd pay. They put together a customer workflow that now they said, what if we replaced mammography completely? Well, the breast radiologists would lose their jobs, technicians would lose their jobs, but hospitals would go, yeah. And so they said, well, what would it take to do that? The insurance companies would love it, and the American College of Gynecologists would love it. 
So maybe we should start thinking about what if we actually attack this market head on? Um, the OBGYNs would like it, the patients would like it, and it would be great for their company. And so they decided to see whether they could do that, um, updated their business model canvas um, with the new things they needed to do, looked at distributors, per use fees, uh, and marketing costs, and they learned how to reach the customers, and now they wanted to know how do they build a company. Now, they talked to some more people and realized that they needed to manufacture the device. They needed to do, know about reimbursement. Reimbursement. Talk about a multi-sided market. Medical device. Who's the customer? Artificial hip. Who's the customer? Really? You putting the hip into them? Patient. Is the patient the customer? All right, who, who's the customer? Well, oh, great. Well, really, the insurance company. Well, how did it get into the patient? Doctors. Who are the doctors? Who are the doctors? You said insurance companies. Who are the doctors? All right, well, who are the doctors? All right. Who, who's the hospital? The answer is, in some markets, multi-sided means lots of sides, not just two. Remember the Google example? Medical devices, wait a minute, there are doctors, there are patients, there's the hospital, there's insurance companies, because unless you have something called the CPT code for reimbursement. Oh, by the way, great, so let's just cook up, we'll get the insurance company, let's just cook up a medical device in our back room and go and plant it. Can we do that in the United States? No, you need the FDA. Boy, there's another side, you need something called the 510K for approval. All of a sudden, for some markets, it's really complex, and these guys are just about to find that out. First of all, they discovered something called CPT codes for insurance reimbursement. Then they realized, uh-oh, the FDA wants us to do clinical trials. Well, look how much that cost, right? Wait a minute, 7.2 million, 20.5 million bucks, just for a new medical device. Isn't it even going into your body, right? And look how long it takes, 48, 63, 69 months. Uh, and how are we going to raise money? So they put together a financial and operations timeline. Now, by the way, these are guys who had never seen anything outside the building. Right? Eight weeks put this together. So their business model canvas went from one to two to three to four to five to six to seven to eight to nine, etc. One last thing, we made the students blog their progress, which all you might want to consider. Even though we saw them week to week, we really wanted to see what they were doing outside the building. So we had them use WordPress to tell us all about a narrative of how they were doing and a business model canvas to show us their progress. So the first guys went out and published their interviews. It didn't have to be fancy, just tell me what you were doing. And the photos and videos of them in the field. Some of the other guys did surveys, the web people, publish your A-B tests. Other people, interviews and photos, competitive analysis, key findings, A-B test results. By the way, there's one other team I need to tell you about. Another team came in front of us, a complete web team. By week four, they only had like 300 people having used their product. They were doing a Groupon clone on the web. And I did, you know what the right B, right? And they said, but how are we going to get more users? And I said, you're entrepreneurs. I don't care how you get users, but you need to like crank this up by a factor of 10 or 100. I don't want to see 200 emails out. You need tens of thousands of people. Tens of thousands. How are we going to do that? I said, you're entrepreneurs. Figure it out. 10 p.m. that night, I get a call from the head of IT of Stanford University. <laughs> Your students have hijacked the Stanford email system, and they've sent out 16,000 emails before we shut down the system. <laughs> and I went, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Man, did I high-five them in class, but I went, oh, not allowed to do that. 
right? When, when we're talking about entrepreneurs, see the rules, right? You see those rules? If you do, you're not an entrepreneur, okay? So they were blogging all this stuff, strategy, etc., canvases. Um, and just as an aside, it turned out all this stuff was great for not only the teaching team, it dawned on me that if you were an angel investor and you put some money in startups, that poor startup to keep you abreast of what's going on either has to have coffee with 15 angels or you have no idea what's going on. So I was having lunch with a VC friend of mine, Sean Carolyn at Menlo Ventures, who's a partner, who wanted me to meet some other entrepreneur, hear what he was doing. And I, as a favor to Sean, I did. And then I said, hey, you know, let me tell you what happened in class. This stuff was really amazing. We were just using WordPress. Boy, imagine if somebody built some real software to do this. And the entrepreneur, Ben Mappin, looked at Sean, and Sean looked at Ben. And Ben, the entrepreneur, said to Sean, this is a much better idea than mine. <laughs> and Sean said, well, and Ben said, I'd like to do it. Only in Silicon Valley. Sean took out his checkbook at lunch, wrote Ben a check for a quarter of a million dollars, and the Lean Launch lab is now taking beta customers. I've used it in my first class, um, and it's real. So if any of you want to do this, um, that is blog your progress, share it with investors and other entrepreneurs. It's actually quite a useful process. So I'm done, um, except for one more thing. Um, the uh, Lean Launch Lab launch pad class was just adopted by the United States government. The National Science Foundation any of you uh, use the NSF or get NSF grants? Give scientists and engineers 18,000 grants a year. It gives out $7 billion of your tax money. They just decided to set up an incubator. They're going to take 100 of the best teams out of those 18,000, pay them 50 grand to come to Stanford to take our class. And they're going to send 25 teams a quarter, and the first teams show up on Monday. So uh, I just thought I'd... So thank you for hanging out so long. Um, I think I've overstayed my welcome, but I'm, if any of you are uh, silly enough to want to stay, I'm happy to take questions from the audience. And there's... Uh, yeah, if people have questions, you can just uh, form a line behind the microphone. Come on, yep. come on up here. Or uh, for those of you who want to get out of here now, um, feel free to. Happy to answer questions about anything. Going, going once. How do you get a C? You don't take the class. Hello? Yeah, so the, all the slides, everything I've ever presented is on slideshare.net slash s blank. Um, so every possible slide deck, including this one, are up online. Um, anything you ever wanted to see. I've open sourced all my classes, all the curriculum, all the syllabus. Um, if you're interested in how this class really worked in detail, on my website is a category called the Lean Launchpad. Just click on that category. I blogged every session of the class with the links to the student slides of what we taught and what they showed up and presented. Question. First of all, thank you so much. Um, second of all, um, we're, we're about to launch um, a mobile app that we've been working on for, cool. for a lot of months. Um, it's going to be Android and, and iPhone. and It's going to be pretty awesome in productivity. Our biggest question right now is, is, is two of our, our competitors in this space are Evernote and uh, Wonderlist, and they've done a great job. Yep. And uh, Evernote got to f a million users in 400 and something days, and Wonderlist did it in like 300 days. Our goal is to do ours in, in 200 days. But the challenge that we're having is we don't want to release it yet until we get a chance to do a lot of uh, customer development. So we've, we've already decided to have like a giant party with like 500 of our friends and have them use it in like a private beta. That way all the negative comments come here before they go into the Apple Store and Perfect. get like one star. When do we do the Mashable tech crunch? Because we have relationships there right. that they can launch it with the whole beta invite. This is a get, great question. When, when is the right time to do that? It's a great question. So um, let me preface all the answers I'm going to give tonight is, with all due respect, it's one asshole's opinion. Okay? No, truly, there are no facts here. They're just opinions. So take them as, as there is. Um, there's one thing about press that's hard to remember when you're passionately doing this. Getting business press is kind of like launching an ICBM. You can't recall it. And when it impacts, 
the consequences are pretty severe. And, and um, Eric Reese, if he hasn't told you the story, uh, sometimes cringes when he does. When he was in my class, him and his partner, uh, Will Harvey, were starting IMVU. And they came in one day so excited that they just got wired on the phone and they were wired was doing a story on them. And when Will and Eric got done with me, they couldn't sit down for a week. And they went, what's wrong? They're wired, it's the big deal. I said, well, what was your positioning? What did you tell them? Oh, we're the best AOL add-on you could ever buy. Now, AOL was the big thing, you know, back then. My point is, their positioning was changing literally on a daily basis. And if you want to talk to the press now, my advice is, the, the heuristic is, has your positioning, that is who you are, what features you're talking about, what users you're going after, been stable for several weeks? Now in the real world, I would probably say months, but no entrepreneur nowadays has that patience. But your positioning and your strategy should not be vibrating like Brownie in motion. Because whatever you then say is just going to be wrong and embarrassing, but you don't, unless you're Apple, get multiple bites at the Apple, so to speak. Your positioning will be locked by what people write about you when you go after that first launch. Am I making sense? And, and, and so it doesn't mean you're going to be wrong. It just means, do we have enough data that this thing has stayed the same? And that's that feedback loop of the brilliant thing you're, that you're thinking about. The test I would do, just as a fun test for yourself, write down what you would say to TechCrunch before you talk to the 500 people. Then talk to the 500 people and go, holy shit, are we glad we didn't talk to them. Am I making sense? Does that help? All right. Uh, 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 good evening, Steve. Uh, this is this is a question I typically ask everyone because you know people have different perspective. Uh, what is, according to you, uh, lean for uh, st a social product? Because uh, you know, to kind of explain my thought, it, it, there is nothing like a specific set of you know features that somebody is going to be you know uh, uh, happy about you know when you're releasing a social product because he himself doesn't know the experience. It's a new experience that you are trying to give someone, and until there is an ecosystem that's formed. A set of features might not really make sense, you know, s some kind of a community or you know, some kind of an ecosystem that's found where somebody can experience that feature with others, you know, that, that set of features might not really make sense. So there is, it, it becomes difficult to go and ask someone if, if you know, if such an experience will really be useful for you or it will be really great. Somebody, peop sometimes people might tell that yes, it will be great, but until you go and test it out, you, you never know, it might really, you know, go the other way. So for testing it out again, you know, you need that ecosystem and you need a minimum set of features which can really, you know, uh, so what's help the question? give the... So, qu so what is your thought with respect to lean approach for social products? So you just defined it and maybe you didn't want to hear it for yourself. Uh, it, lean works the same way. It's just that the ecosystem you need to test is a little broader. If, if the answer you want to get to is, therefore, I need to launch the product to the entire ecosystem, you've come to a conclusion without figuring out what is a test I could run? So let's agree that in some social products, you might want to test something more than a set of users. You might want to see, is this thing viral? What happens when, is, is there a network effect? What happens in the network? But the, but the excuse usually is, therefore, I need to launch it and see. Um, I, I just think that's a bullshit answer. And I don't mean that you're giving me that, though you might. Um, <laughs> um, I think the challenge to you is, Great, I agree, it requires an ecosystem. How do I go test the ecosystem without launching the entire product and peeing in my pants in front of the entire you know, world when it's almost irretrievable? And the, the onus back to you is, am I creative enough to figure out how to construct those tests? Am I making sense? I mean, I'm agreeing with you, you've defined the problem, but I'm afraid I hear this question a lot because then there's a conclusion that says, see, we just need to launch it. I just believe that that's just a weak answer. And I'm happy to brainstorm later if you want to think about the ways to do that. But there are ways to test, so, you know, which part of the social network do you want to test? How much do I need to test? Is the answer binary, that I could get no data or I could get some? I just think that that's a cop-out. Does that answer your question? Next. If anybody has. Yeah? Hey, um, just want to say thanks a lot. Um, and. I'm hoping to get your opinion on uh, how you think going about uh, entering a market that's pretty litigious 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> and doing it in a lean fashion. What's what's the best way to go about that? We just don't want to you know shoot give ourselves me, in the foot. Give me an example. Um, online gaming, like online casino environment, like the poker scene. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, you, you know, you know um, people who uh, volunteer for war zones. Um, <laughs> 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 should not expect to come home alive. I mean, um, you know, <laughs> wh which part of full tip, uh, tilt poker did you not understand? Oh, no, I, absolutely. I mean, but, but really, so like, the long... That has nothing to do with lean. That's an intelligence test. Um, and, 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 uh, no, no, I, I don't mean to dish you, but, no, no, but, no, no. but, but you're asking, this has nothing to, your question is nothing to do with lean. It's about risk, reward, Etc. about any type of business. You're truly, uh, uh, consciously, which is good, going to decide to enter a war zone because you've decided there's an opportunity there given that what's happened. And I'm not denying that there might be. But you now know the risks. And the risks are how you prepare for risks in a war. You buy you know, bulletproof armor and whatever. And in your case, it's what country has no extradition you know, treaty? No, I'm dead serious. I mean, I would be thinking about all those things. About it's true, we, we are. No, I know you are, right? right? So, so uh, but, but don't make this a lean thing. This is truly a, I understand what the risks are. Gee, I hope the reward is commensurate with you know, five to 10 in a federal pen. Um, <laughs> and I'm not being facetious. I mean, you're picking a business that the US government has now declared, for whatever reason, something that they're not happy about. Maybe some large donors from Las Vegas don't want to have that happen. I, and that's not probably a, a bad hypothesis. Am I making sense? No, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and so I don't mean to, to, I mean, if I were you and I were your parents, you know, <laughs> I'd be like sending you away for a while. Uh, <laughs> in, fact, in fact, the Marines in Afghanistan are probably looking for you. I mean, <laughs> now don't laugh. I mean, my career started, you know, during the Vietnam War when I volunteered <laughs> to join the Air Force. So. I, I did the equivalent, but um, I could just claim stupidity. You seem a little smarter than that. So, <laughs> no, uh, but truly all the things you're thinking about, I would get all the lawyers you could find. I would find uh, people who wrote the law who are now retired. I would you know, be hiring consultants or whatever. But I would truly understand the consequences about the one you just picked because the government's declared war on you. Um, that's yeah, my two cents. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, in line. So uh, first off, I'm probably not the only person by a long stretch. I just want to acknowledge you because I've been an entrepreneur since 1994 and I feel like I just got whacked in the head and it, in a way that made me feel like all of a sudden I understand my own value, you know? Like I, I've been trying to, I'm like, well, I'm not quite like that. I'm really trying to fit into the big company thing. And actually, I'm a phenomenal asset in a startup. And I'd be a nightmare in a big right, company. Right, me too. So, you know, so I, I mean, it's like you just pulled a gigantic thorn out of my foot or something. And, le so and let me better. make you even feel better or worse. Um, uh, a <laughs> yeah. couple of things. One is I believe that there's a genetic pattern of there were, you know, when we were on the savanna as a tribe, there was everybody who was intelligent who said, hey, the grass is green. Look, we have antelope and whatever. And there were always the bunch of crazies who went, what's over that hill? <laughs> and 90% of them never came back, right? They were, well, over the hill was a big scary thing. But about 10% of the time they went, hey, there's the antelope, come up and fall down at your feet over here. And that's why that genetic pattern, I think, continued as a recessive but important gene in human race. The other, <laughs> that's my theory. But the other theory, which I actually ask classes, and I, you guys don't have to raise your hand, but there's another pattern about founding CEOs. Just do the test. You can raise your hand if you want. How many of you are founding CEOs or you know, founders? How many of you have come from dysfunctional families? <laughs> right? You don't have to raise your right. Dysfunctional families, unfortunately, are the world's best creators of founders. Founders. Because the survivors, not everyone, most People don't survive that process. But for those of you who are, who are here, you know what it's like operating in a permanent state of chaos and bringing order out of chaos in your life. Some of you are going, 
holy shit, how did he know? And, <laughs> and they were looking around going, and does, does he figure it out that it was me? Um, turns out there's a higher percentage of CEOs who come from dysfunctional families. It's the only time in your life, and probably the first time in your life, that you have an extreme competitive advantage over normal people. <laughs> Big idea, it's true. And two is, it will explain why you will personally fuck up your company when it becomes successful. <laughs> because here's what happens. Founders from dysfunctional families are wonderful. Under fire, smoke, battle, things changing. It's a, hey, it's a normal day. I grew up like this. <laughs> I didn't even know what the hell was going to happen when I opened the door when I went home. That's how I grew up. But when things start going well in a normal company, you need to start doing the same thing day to day and be repeatable. And that drives those people crazy to such an extent that they will throw hand grenades into their own organization to keep chaos going. Anybody ever work for those people? Yeah. Now you can understand who you're working for and why. Any of you are those people? All right. No, seriously, if you are, just understand it's no longer it's about you. It is about a type. Congratulations. Just now understand that as you grow up and, and at either age or, or, you know, or maturity, you need to understand who you are, what it gave you that was great, and also what it gave you that could be destructive in all forms of your life. So I just wanted to, I don't even know how we got there from there, but it's... <laughs> I was uh, with you the whole way. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I got to tell you, that was me, and until I got to a certain age, I went, wait, that's what made me great, and then I realized, look at all that broken glass I've left. How the hell did that get here? Um, and then as you get older, you realize that was a good part, but you need the other part in your life as well. Now, what was your question? So my question, actually, I just want to add one thing you yeah. said about the, the, yeah. the entrepreneur gene. Yeah. I, I, we can argue this later, but I genuinely believe that women drive evolution. Yeah. And I have noticed that girls like guys who are a little crazy looking. <laughs> so I think there's a genetic reason. All right, happened. what's the question? The question <laughs> is, I just want to hear, like, your, was your epiphany, I want to hear more about when this hit you what it was like or where it was in the classes when you, mean, you went in and which heard part? Other the customer development part or the uh, uh, what did the difference between like you know startups and big companies and how people fit in both so um, so the four steps of the epiphany was the process of customer development uh, and it was like inventing string theory without understanding the rest of physics that is if you really think about it again do we have any of the MBAs who still stayed um, because I'm going to tell you guys something that's really might be relevant for your careers. Anybody know when the first MBA was issued? Harvard, 1908. Dartmouth did one a little before, but didn't call it an MBA. Anybody know the first modern corporation? East India Company, about 1600. The Greeks had companies and Romans, but the first modern corporation, if you squinted, was the East India Company. So 300 years between the first modern corporation and the issuance of the first MBA. The first question people in business school ask is, how the hell did they have companies without MBAs? <laughs> <laughs> the second thing is, whoever that was at Harvard was brilliant. Because what they did was simply concatenate 300 years of business knowledge and make a management stack for execution and administration, masters of business.